said, well, my wife found a tick. It's a deer tick. I said, okay, so what's the problem? He said, well, we took it off, and she threw it in the toilet, and before she could flush it, it disappeared. He says, what should I do? I said, use another toilet. Uh, <laughs> because, because somewhere in that toilet room, <laughs> there's a tick just waiting for someone to sit down. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine. This has been a particularly bad year for deer ticks. October was warmer than average, and ticks were more numerous than average. It's now November, and many of us are in the woods probably hunting. On any day that's over 40 degrees, there's a good chance you're going to bring a tick home with you, or several. Dr. Jim Dill is a pest management specialist at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Service. Ticks are one of those pests he has to manage. A few weeks ago, he gave the Tick Talk, a lecture at Fields Pond Audubon Center in Holden. What he presented on that Friday evening could be life-saving. Ticks carry Lyme disease and several other bacterial infections. They can also carry a potentially deadly virus. On today's show, the Tick Talk. What they are, what to do about them, how to keep them off, what to do if they get on, how to reduce the threat around the house, and what won't work. Bob Deshane's Wild Maine is brought to you by Hammond Lumber, Napa Auto Parts, and EBS. And now, Dr. Jim Dill. Mainly, we'll talk about deer ticks tonight, but I will mention also the dog tick and the winter tick, also people call the moose tick. And so we'll, we'll talk about uh, all three of those, but as I say, I want to spend my time on the deer tick. And here on this side is the deer tick, also called the black-legged tick. And if you want to think about that, think of your hamburger bun. The adult deer tick is about the size of that seed on your hamburger bun. That's how small they are. That's the adult. Then you move down to the next stage, which is the nymph, and that's about the size of a poppy seed. So these are the things that you're trying to find on you. And the first stage is the larval stage, which is the first thing that I'm going to hand around to everybody to try to find. There's probably a hundred of them in there. What we're looking at is a little vial filled with a liquid. At the bottom, there's a little cloudy substance that looks like chili powder. That's right. Each tick in the larval stage is so tiny it's no bigger than a fleck of powder. You'd never see it. And those get on rodents. So what happens with the deer tick population, when we have a good nut crop, a mast crop in the woods, and you got lots of acorns and beech nuts and that type of thing, then what happens is the rodent population is good. If the rodent population is good, then the little larval ticks, the larval deer ticks, can find their rodent host. And that is where these guys pick up their diseases. So they feed on the rodents. They pick up Lyme disease. They pick up anaplasmosis. They pick up babesiosis. And they also can pick up Powassan virus. Now, when you think of the deer tick and feeding and engorging on you, the situation is that the deer tick, for the most part, has to feed for a minimum of 24 hours to transmit Lyme disease organisms. Some doctors will tell you it may be even a lot longer than that, 36 or so. And we think it's about the same for anaplasmosis, or anaplasmosa, and babesiosa. But the Wasson virus is a matter of minutes that they think it transmits it. So when you're thinking of the problems here in the state of Maine, this deer tick can transmit up to seven different disease-causing organisms. And those three are the most common. The Powassan virus, unfortunately, you may remember in December of, I think it was 2013, down in the Rockland area, a lady died. And she died of either Powassan virus or deer tick fever. It's a closely related virus. And what happened was she did have a tick on her. She was being treated and was making some progress for Lyme disease and anaplasmosis at the same time. Because a lot of times you can get co-infections anyway. So I think what happened was they, she was on antibiotics. She took a little uptick. No pun intended. <laughs> and then all of a sudden she crashed. And what happened was they weren't thinking of the virus. 
And of course, as being a virus, there's really no cure for the virus. So right now, this is the season of the deer tick, adult. Right now, they're everywhere. I had a friend call me last week who lives in Clinton. And he, this was on Wednesday. He says, you know, I let my dog out. And, you know, or he says, or my wife and dog goes out either way. He says, and the dog comes back with ticks on it, and so does my wife. And he says, a lot of them. I says, really? He says, yeah. I says, well, why don't you collect me a few? So he said, well, I'm coming up to Orono on Monday. He says, I'll collect them for the next five days. Here's what he collected oh my gosh. in five days. Okay, if there were that many ticks in my yard, I'd move. This vial has several dozen ticks in it. Now, this was back in October. Colder weather will lower the tick number a little bit in November, unless it's warm. So anyway, so this is the time of year when the adult deer tick is out. And as you can see from that vial, I mean, that's really only four days of, of five days of collecting. Uh, that's an amazing number, even in my head, for deer ticks to be in such a small area. Now, he does have plenty of deer there. And he's surrounded by woods, which are mostly oak and beech. And, of course, you're going to have plenty of mice there. So he's got the perfect environment for deer ticks. So right now, the deer tick is out. They're feeding, trying to find a host, usually deer or large mammals, what the adults are looking for. And what they do is they have this questing behavior. And they walk up, usually about you know thigh high or lower, and they get on the end of a branch or something, and they sit there and they hang on with their hind six legs, and their front two legs just wave like this all the time on the front of them until something comes by and they just grab onto it. So because of that behavior, if you think you have ticks, we actually suggest that you use a tick drag around the house. And all it is is just a, a piece of cloth like felt or you know something that's kind of fuzzy and you just put it like on a flagpole and you know and you just drag it around. And the place you want to drag the most is a woods grass interface. That's usually where you're going to find the, the ticks. Several reasons. One is that's probably where you know the rodents are going to be hanging along that edge and not going to be running out into the middle of your driveway or whatever. And if you watch deer at all, that's typically their behavior too until they get out into the middle of the field to feed or whatever. They walk along that area. Now we do find deer ticks 12 months of the year. So if it's 40 degrees or above, they'll be active. So we get them sent in all year long. Middle of the winter, if it's 40 degrees, a few of them will get active and out they'll come. Now if you have a good snow cover, that usually will keep the numbers down, even though it might be air temperature or maybe warm enough. But if it's covered with snow, of course, they're not going to burrow up through the snow. Plus, it's pretty much the same temperature down there at the ground level covered with snow, no matter what the temperature is outside. So anyway, so they're out there questing. <clears throat> if they find a host, they feed. The males just feed very sporadically. They have a much hotter body than the female. The female bloats right up. Next vial to come around contains a female deer tick that has been feeding. Deer ticks are small, smaller than dog ticks, which also like to get on people. And once the deer tick starts sucking your blood, it bloats right up, especially the female. You might have trouble seeing a female deer tick before it's been feeding, but when they bloat up to this size, they do get easier. This one is nearly the size of a pencil eraser. So if they find a host right now, then they just go sit down, find a nice place to spend the winter, and they spend the winter essentially fat and happy because they're really engorged. If they don't find a host, same thing. Females and males go down and they spend the winter down there. Then in the spring, the females come out, start feeding, and um, lay their eggs, and the eggs hatch near the end of summer, about August, and then they, in turn, now the larvae, looking for the little mice, they feed on the mice, drop off, and become nymphs, and the nymphs can overwinter too. So there's this crazy life cycle in that at any given time, you can have a lot of the different stages out there. But mostly, what we have is this time of year is the biggest peak for the adult deer tick. In April, May, you have another peak, because those are the overwintering ones. 
during the end of the summer, you have the larvae because they've just hatched from the eggs. And you've got the nymphs that have overwintered from the year before, too. So it's almost like a reverse cycle because you'd expect egg, larvae, nymph, adult. But it's more like adult, nymph, egg, larvae, which is kind of a really screwy life cycle. And that's why it's really mixed up and it's a two year life cycle. You're listening to Dr. Jim Dill, pest management specialist at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Service. This is the Tick Talk, a presentation about ticks that was given at Fields Pond Audubon Center in late October. We've been mostly talking about the deer tick, which has a nasty reputation for carrying Lyme disease, but it's not the only tick in Maine. The dog tick is also very interested in sucking your blood, and it's next. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. It's Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. We are at the Tick Talk. Dr. Jim Dill is a pest management specialist at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Service. He is one of the state's leading authorities on tick and tick management. This presentation happened a few weeks ago at Fields Pond Audubon Center in Holden. So far in the show, we've been talking a lot about deer ticks, which carry most of the dreaded diseases we worry about. But it's not the only tick. Now, the dog tick used to be about the only tick. I grew up in southern Maine. I didn't know what a tick was growing up in southern Maine. And I think probably everybody will tell you the same thing that's lived in Maine. I didn't know what a tick was growing up. I spent my entire life, it seemed like, as a kid crawling everywhere in the woods and the grass. And I never saw a tick. I went to visit my uncle who lived in Pennsylvania. My mother used to panic about, you know, oh, we've got to watch out for ticks and Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever was the, was the big <laughs> issue. You know, and still even down there, we never got them on us. But the point was, the dog tick which is considerably larger, even um, not engorged, was the more common tick. And every now and then you'd have a few um, on people here. Now, I've been at the university since 1981, and I'd have to look back in the records to see, but certainly early in my career, we didn't have ticks sent in to us at all. It's been the last 10, 12 years that we've really started getting the ticks sent in to us. Um, the Maine Medical Center have been doing research on them though for about 25 years, so we know that they have been around. And now we have uh, uh, taken over kind of some of their tick analysis work at the, at the university. So back to the, the disease just for a minute. As you know, I mean, it's a terrible, terrible disease, Lyme disease. Um, there are several different uh, Lyme disease groups here in the state of Maine. Um, they meet regularly um, to talk about the disease and uh, what to do about it. And it's one of those things that as the tick feeds and you go, and whenever we have a tick sent in that's been feeding, we just say, we'll talk to your doctor. And a lot of doctors, as a matter of course, will not give you an antibiotic. What they tell you is to wait for the symptoms occur, and it could wait, take up to six weeks for the symptoms occur. And of course, we all know what's, what's the most common symptom of Lyme disease. Bullseye rash. The problem is, only about 50 or 60% of the cases actually get the bullseye rash. Oh, great. There's a chance you've just gotten Lyme disease. The most immediate symptom is a bullseye rash around the bite site, but almost half the time it's not there or you can't see it. And to make it more complicated, there are 14 species of tick in Maine. So which one was it that really bit you? Some of them are closely related to deer ticks, but aren't. So we have the deer tick, we have a rabbit tick, and we have a woodchuck tick, which all look very, very similar. You have to look at them under the scope to figure out the differences between them. Now when I talked to you earlier about Powassan disease, or Powassan virus, it's usually associated with the woodchuck tick. Um, and, and we don't test ticks yet. The new lab that will be built and open next year will be able to test the ticks here in Maine. So before I move into management of them, I will talk briefly about the last tick that I wanted to mention, and that's the winter tick or the moose tick. You probably heard the moose ticks have been killing off Maine moose. This is an entirely different kind of tick. It's got a one-year life cycle, and it's got only one thing in mind right now. Get on a moose before winter or freeze to death. 
They cluster by the thousands, and they cling to bushes much higher up than normal ticks do because the moose is much taller. It's not pleasant when you find a mat of them in the woods, like the guy who was just in Jim Dill's office. He says, this is the third time since I've been out bow hunting four times this year, and three times, he says, I've come back covered with these little things. He says, what are they? And they were winter ticks or moose ticks. I guess the good thing about them is occasionally one of them will, will kind of nip you or try to feed on you, but decide that they don't like you at all. And so, so basically they don't feed on, on humans. So right now, um, their larvae, which are a little bit bigger than what you just saw here that I passed out on the, on the deer tick larvae, but they are all together. So when you walk through them, you can literally have hundreds of those crawling on you. So same thing happens to a moose. A moose goes through there and in one patch can pick up several hundred ticks. And they can lay up to 1,500 eggs. So you can imagine 1,500 eggs and with the moose tick, all of them together, if they all hatch or all survive, well, one fell swoop, that moose just picked up 1,500 ticks. He does that eight, nine, ten times, all of a sudden, you know, he's got tens of thousands of ticks on him. So, so they're pretty good size. So you can imagine 10,000 of those or more hanging off in a moose. They're going to cause some real problems. And the problem they really cause, sometimes there's enough of them so there's a little uh, anemia in the moose. But the biggest problem is they're irritable, irritating, I should say, and they try to rub them off. And what they end up doing is rubbing the hair off, and then they die of exposure. So that, between the anemia and the exposure, that's what often will, will, will kill a moose, take them down. And we often will hear people say, oh yeah, I was out snowmobiling and there was a moose side of the um, trail, he got up and it was all blood there. Well, the thing is, they just keep on feeding and feeding. Like when these guys get full and engorged, they drop off. But with the winter tick, it just keeps on feeding and it just kind of excretes the excess blood. So even though those big ones you saw there, eh, they're just sitting there just kind of pumping blood through a little bit. So that's why that will be on, be on the snow. The voice you're hearing is Dr. Jim Dill, a pest management specialist at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Service. This is the Tick Talk presented to a Maine Audubon audience in Holden a few weeks ago. It's relevant now because there are a lot of hunters in the woods hunting deer and being hunted by deer ticks. So it's time to discuss how to avoid them, and that'll be next. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine, Saturday mornings at 9, Sunday mornings at 8 on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. Jim Dill is the TikTok doc. He's a pest management specialist at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Service. His office is absolutely full of ticks right now, hopefully all dead. So far, we've talked about ticks and the diseases they carry. We've talked about the life cycle of various ticks. The next question is obvious. So how do you try to avoid ticks? And it's really difficult to do. Um, as I told you, you know, it's like thigh high down for the most part is where they are. There's lots of things that, uh, that we suggest, and some of those are to use uh, insecticide repellents. And there's a couple of them out there that uh, are recommended by CDC. Um, one, of course, is uh, DEET, Bicaridin, and IR3535. So those are the three CDC recommended repellents to keep deer off you that you can put on your skin. The best tick repellent is permethrin. Permethrin can only go on your clothing. So what we, I recommend, if you do a lot of hiking or whatever, I say just keep a pair of shoes and pants, especially, and socks that you wear just when you're out hiking and you treat them with permethrin and you can wash them and then bag them up. They're all ready to go the next time. You can buy clothing that's already impregnated with permethrin. Um, the commercial ones can withstand 30 or 40 washings before it's pretty well gone. With treating them yourself, we find that probably maybe 10 washings or less. Um, 
So why I say just big enough that helps just keep it there too. It just doesn't degrade as much. Um, but just be aware if you're treating yourself, I would do it probably every six washings. I would probably retreat that that hiking gear. So that's the repellent side of things, how to try to keep the ticks off of you. Now avoidance is probably a good way too, um, even though that's probably the more difficult, but as we already said, that grass woods interface is where it's really, really probably where you're going to find the most of the deer ticks. And as I said, they'll be out when it's 40 degrees or above. Now they're very, very susceptible to drying out. So they really like to have their little niche where they are, about 80% humidity. So that's why you kind of find them in the shadows and, and like this gentleman said, his uh, brother used to get him on him all the time out hiking, but then he told me that his brother liked to hike first thing in the morning about it, about, you know, don't. So that made sense. It's cool, it's moist, fog, dew. Um, in the heat of the day, they're going to be more hidden. So they're going to be more in the woods, they're going to be down in the duff. That still doesn't mean you can't get them because, you know, if you're sloughing your shoes through there, you're still going to kick them up on you. That's why if you've got to treat it with the permethrin, the permethrin does two things. It does repel them, but it can also kill them if they get a big enough dose while they're crawling on you. Um, so <clears throat> try to avoid those types of area. If you're out hiking, I usually suggest that if it's a kind of a trail, you try to stay in the middle of the trail if you can. Because once you move over to that edge, again, you get that edge effect. And probably the best method, though, is always when you get done, when you've been out hiking, is come back and do a tick check. Now, you see what they look like, and I have had people send larvae in that they've picked off their kids. How they ever found those is beyond me, but the point is, we're driving the point home that the best thing you can do is to go in and do a tick check. So I always suggest that if you've been out hiking or out any place where you think that there's going to be deer ticks, the first thing you want to do when you get back is take that clothing off and if it's something you, you don't, it, it's, it's okay to do, I just say throw it right in the dryer, don't wash it, throw it in the dryer. The heat, again, if you remember, it's going to take them right out. Then do a tick check on yourself. And if you had kids with you, do a tick check on them. Then the next day, when you get up, do the same thing. Because you think if you missed them, unfortunately, they may have been feeding all night. They're a little easier to see the next day. And where they like to go, usually is tight-fitting places. Again, where you think it's, it's, it's well, you get them anywhere. I, I think the challenge you had in the middle of his back. But often you get them like in the armpits, in the groin area. That's a, a, a waste. If anything that's tight fitting, you know, it's a nice kind of place for them to hide and feel protected. Um, but armpits and groin, of course, it's a little more moist there for them too. So again, that's the areas that they, they like. And behind the ears, for some reason, we find a lot of hairlines. And you figure too that a lot of times the place to check is a pie. Because if you get them on your pants, for whatever reason, they have a tendency to crawl up, not down. So if you get them on you, chances are they're going to crawl up, and maybe the first place they find is, is the hairline. The other thing when you're out hiking, wear light clothing. And the reason why you can't what light color clothing, the ticks are easier to see on. Because if they're on dark, you know, you, you see what they've colored like. You just, you just can't see them very well. So certainly, um, wear light colored clothing. You know, we have a lot of people say, well, I'm not going to go to all that trouble. You know, I'm going to hike the way I want to hike. And I said, that's fine. If you're going to wear shorts and sandals or whatever, just be aware that you should do a, do a tick check. The other thing is, you know, with long pants, you can just put a rubber band around them too and to keep them in. They actually have specially made uh, things. I can't remember off the top of my head. I can't remember what they're called. But there's a special, it's a, it's a clamp of some type that goes around the leg. And a lot of them are treated with permethrin too. So again, that holds the pant leg in, the idea being that they're not going to crawl up inside the pant leg. But it's really good if you're going to do this to make sure you treat your socks because that's, you know, that way they can't crawl up and, and get inside. Okay, you put repellent on your skin, you put permethrin on your light-colored clothing, you've tucked your pant legs into your socks, you've done a tick check, and everything is fine. 
24 hours later, you find an engorged tick on you. <sighs> Never mind how the little bugger got there. What are you going to do about it now? Well, you've got to get it off. They can stay on you for five to seven days. So as fat as that little bugger is right now, he's just going to get bigger. A bigger bugger. There are tools, but the most likely gadget laying around the house is a pair of tweezers. The pointy er the better. So if you've got really, really fine nose forceps or tweezers, and what you want to do is grab right down close to the skin and slowly pull on that. Just keep slow, even motion and pull it out. Do not put nail polish, Vaseline, blow out a match, put it on its butt. What happens if that puts it? What's it going to do? Just like we would. So it could regurgitate more into um, that bite if you put a hot match on its butt. Or if you cover it with something, it's smothering. It takes a while to smother. You can put a deer tick or a dog tick in a little vial of water and it'll live for several days. Now I had a senator call me last fall and said, I have a problem. I said, what's the problem? He said, well, my wife found a tick. It's a deer tick. I said, okay, so what's the problem? He said, well, we took it off and she threw it in the toilet and before she could flush it, it disappeared. So they can move faster than you think. So what had happened, it never hit the water, it hit the edge of the toilet and it zipped up the toilet. He says, what should I do? I said, use another toilet. Uh, <laughs> because, because somewhere in that toilet room, <laughs> there's a tip just waiting for someone to sit down. Uh, but, you know, they basically, I, you know, flush it and, you know, you get those toilet bowl cleaners, you know, that squirt up under the rim. But the amazing thing is, I mean, they're, they're faster than you think, and underwater they can live for two or three days. Uh, even in alcohol, they'll live for, you know, a few hours. There are, in fact, many products in the market that do a better job of gently lifting the tick away from the skin. Dr. Dillis brought a whole box full of small, cheap plastic spoons that have little slots in the front. You slide the slot under the tick and gently lift. There's no chance of accidentally squeezing it too hard, and when you're done, the tick is sitting right there in the bowl of the spoon. Plus, with the forceps of the tweezers, if it's an animal, you're going to get a whole bunch of hair. And you, even though you're trying to pull slowly, you've got a whole fistful of hair. And maybe even some of us, you may have a whole fistful of hair trying to get there, or a big chunk of skin that you're pulling on. And if you've got a kid, and you know, you've gone and, and you're doing this, <laughs> they're not too pleased the next time they think they have a tick on them and you're coming at them with this because it hurt. Now I have, we have some, several um, pediatricians in Bangor that come to the office regularly and get a handful of these because they use them, they'll give them to parents, especially the parent that's been in three or four times. And, but two reasons for that. One is if it's a pet, the hair, you'll see there's a little notch here. And as a matter of fact, when I just pass these around before I uh, start talking about them, so, so grab one or two if you want. Um, <clears throat> it, ha it looks like a little measuring spoon, ice cream spoon. It's got a little slot in one side of it. And as that slides along, the hairs slide right out of it for the most part. So all you've got is the tick. And with a little kid, of course there's no hair there, but you're not pinching the skin with those very pointy forceps that of course the doctors know that's what you've got to use and those are the ones that kind of hurt. And all you do with those, if the tick is there, it doesn't matter what angle you come in from, you know, you just come in, and you come in slowly from the side or whatever, and you just slowly move it through. And eventually, it does let go, and it ends up in the spoon, and you can dispose of it, not by flushing it down the toilet, but, you know, any way you want to get, get rid of it. And then just clean the wound with, you know, antibiotic, alcohol, soap and water, whatever, just, just, to, just to clean it up. Okay, so much for people, but you let your dog out at night to water the bushes, and he comes back in with unwanted guests. You might not even know it until he sleeps in the bed with you. Dr. Jim Dill has a good trick for that, too. He's giving his TikTok at Field Spawn Audubon Center in Holden, and I'm there to record it because this is pretty good stuff for those of us who love to be outdoors. Stand by for the pet trick. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. 
This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. Dr. Jim Dill is a pest management specialist at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Service. He is giving the Tick Talk to a bunch of Maine Audubon members at the Fields Pond Audubon Center in Holden. This happened a few weeks ago, and I had a front row seat. He's offering up some tips on how to deal with ticks. And here's one thing you can try on your dog. When he comes in from his nightly visit to the yard, get out the lint roller. Yeah, the lint roller. You roll it. And not only, and my understanding is this is just a regular lint roller, but my understanding is they actually have extra sticky ones too. But on short haired animals, this works fairly well. You know, they come in and you just rub them all over and you do it. And some people have told me, since I've told this, they said, my dog loves it. You know, he's, he's ready for you know his roll every night. So, um, and what it does, it, it does, it rolls the ticks off because the ticks are right pretty much on the surface at that point in time. They haven't burrowed in, plus a short hair. Now, a long-haired cat or a long-haired dog, it probably doesn't do you much good to try that. You know, you might be able to get some that you didn't see if they're dark colored, but uh, um, it works really, really well in short hairs. Once they've come in. The ticks are on the surface, they haven't burrowed down in, like you said, and, um, so it's at least a start to get some of them off, so. and especially if they're you know, a dark colored dog or a cat or whatever. Cats doesn't seem to work so well on them because I certainly can't get my cats to stand still while I try to roll them, so. uh, but for dogs, it, uh, it does seem to work quite well. What else would work? How about a hot shower right after you come indoors? A shower works fine, I guess most of them would get most of them off. Um, but if one is even begin to attach, you're not going to get it off because they, they, they're very interesting little critters. Um, <clears throat> you can maybe kind of see it on this, but this is called the hypostome, and that's what they stick in you. Is this little piece right here? They do not get inside you. Um, a lot of people say, "Oh yeah, they burrow right down in." They can't. All they've got is this little thing, and the the palps that cover it, they just go to the side. So all you've got is a sixteenth of an inch maybe that can go into you. What will happen is the skin may swell up around it. Your body reaction, so people say, oh my gosh, it's embedded right in me. So this has little barbs on it, so it's like a mosquito. So when it goes in, you know, you, you got the barbs in there. The next thing it does, it puts out a little protein that allows the blood to flow nicely. So it's an anticoagulant. So the blood can flow and they can sit there and just suck your blood and and uh, you know it's going full, nice. And they put a little anesthetic in, so you don't know that they're doing it to you. And the third thing they throw in there, just for good measure, is super glue. They have another protein <laughs> that glues them in place. So you've got barbs and glue. So that's why what happens if you try to rip them out quickly, the head comes off or the hypostome comes off, but you leave a piece behind. So by doing it slow, for some reason, just doing it slowly, they will actually release themselves and let go. But if you yank them, 90% of the time you're going to leave something behind. Or you get a big chunk of skin with it. And that's usually when the kids or the dog are, so stay away from me, you know. You don't really like me anymore. So, <laughs> um, so that's, that's the problem because it's really kind of glued right in there. And so you get either a chunk of skin or you leave a piece behind. Those are your two choices because of that glue. So that's why we try to do it slow. Then still, you know, the next day you definitely want to do a, a tick check because, as I say, once they've been there, then they're a little easier to see. And as we're all getting a little older, we start finding more and more freckles and moles. And <laughs> so all of a sudden they're a lot harder to see. I mean, let's face it. So. What about spraying your property with insecticide? Well, most people don't want to poison the yard. That's pretty drastic. There used to be a natural organic compound that we did use, and you'll never guess what it was. It was rosemary oil. And there was a formulation of it, a commercially um, available formulation of it that they did tests on in Massachusetts. And it was as, as a, effective as bifenthrin, which is the standard synthetic pyrethrin that they use to control the manufacturer, for some reason, changed the formulation uh, of that particular rosemary oil, renamed it, same company, but just put it out as a different name, but it was still rosemary oil, and the effectiveness went from like 90% down to like 25%. Why they did that, we don't know, and we, the company hasn't given an answer to us, so the new one out there doesn't 
work that well. So organically, there's nothing that really works great that I have seen. And I'm not going to put anybody down. There are companies here in, in the state that will come in and spray your property for ticks using organic materials. And you might get some short term effectiveness from those, but they have no lasting ability usually is what we see. Um, so we just haven't found anything. I haven't seen anything from research that shows that there's anything out there organically yet that works really, really well. They have some nematodes that they're experimenting with. They have, there's some um, fungal pathogens they're experimenting with. Uh, again, they're not to the stage where you know I'm comfortable in saying, sure, you want to go get some of the nematodes and go get some of the fungal formulations and spray it and it'll take care of your ticks. Not there yet. Okay, here's another one. Could you burn the grasses around the house first thing in the spring and eliminate the ticks that way? Probably not, and the reason why I say that, that might help more with the wood ticks, or the dog tick, the American dog tick. Um, they're much more hardy, and they're found out further into um, grassy areas. The deer tick, if you remember, it really is susceptible to drying out. So they don't get far away from cover, shade, that type of thing. Um, so burning, I don't think, is going to help much. Where my office is in Orono, going down to the university, there's a field across from it. Any given day, you can go out there and you can find you know, 15, 20 deer roaming around. And we go over there all the time to sample because somebody says, oh, we give a talk, can you bring some live ticks in? So we say, sure, why not? There's 20 deer that lives across the street from me in the, in the field. We go out there and we can hardly ever find them. I mean, we can find them occasionally along the edge, but we never can find them out in the field. That's not to say that they might not be there, but they're just... We just can't ever seem to find them out there. So I, I don't think that that's going to be a suitable answer to controlling ticks. I also get the same question on these wild turkeys, guinea hens, chickens. Are they going to solve my problem? No, because they're not looking for them. If they stumble across one, and they see it move, yeah, boom, it's, 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 you know, dinner or pot of dinner. But they're not real good at, you know, actually looking for them. And the flip side of that is, is if a turkey wanders by one and it doesn't see it for its dinner, the, the tick may see the turkey and get the turkey for its dinner. So, um, you know, they do get on birds. Can't beat them, can't eat them. What are we going to do? Our speaker is Jim Dill. He's not just Dr. Dill, he's Senator Dill. There are some public policy questions here. As this menace grows, we need the tools to fight back. Right now, there aren't many places that can actually identify ticks, which is important when deciding if preventative treatment is necessary. There are even fewer places that can test and engorge tick to see if it was carrying disease, and which disease. Faster diagnosis is going to become critical as we find more diseases being spread by ticks. But right now, the labs are distant and the results are slow and expensive. What are we going to do? That's next. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket. This is Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine on Sports Radio 92.9, The Ticket. It's The Tick Talk today. Dr. Jim Dill is a pest management specialist at the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Service. He's also a Maine state senator. So he's at the forefront of a major public policy issue, the rapid increase in tick-borne diseases. During a talk at the Fields Pond Audubon Center, we went over the challenges of fighting ticks. The state has to step up its game. We have to identify ticks faster, identify infections faster, and get the medical community on the same page about treatments. Lyme disease is very difficult to diagnose, even, even with the symptoms. Because basically, if you get the symptoms, they just assume you've got Lyme disease and they treat it with the antibiotics and, you know, 95% of the people, wham, bang, it work, they're free and clear. But if they want, if it's after the fact and people are having some other symptoms or concerns, it's very hard to diagnose. And I think that's the big problem. And if it's one of the viral diseases, it's very difficult to figure that out. So first off, we've got to get better diagnostic tools for the diseases. And then as you say, you know, then we've got to get all together on the same page. Because if the kid is eight or nine years or younger, 
As a matter of course, they won't put them on antibiotics anyway. They always tell you to wait for the symptoms. So that's why then people go and have the tick tested. And I'll be one of the first to admit, even though we're going to start testing ticks next year, the only thing I can tell you is when you send me a tick, is, oh, that tick did not have the Lyme disease organism in it. That doesn't mean you don't have Lyme disease, because you only found one of the two ticks that get on you. And the other tick may have had the Lyme disease organism. So all I can tell you at that point in time is about that tick. Now, the flip side of that is, if I tell you that tick had the Lyme disease organism in it, then if I was you, I'd be beating feet back to my doctor and say, hey, the tick he tested that was engorged had, you know, the Lyme disease in it, disease in it, organism, and let's put me on antibiotics. And the quickness of the turnaround time, that's one of the things we want to do, at least for the people in Maine, plus we don't want to charge them $50 a test, which is what it is now. Okay, well, here's an idea that's been tried elsewhere. Set up feeding stations in the woods. When the deer come up to grab some apples or whatever, they get sprayed with tick repellent or somehow get vaccinated. It's, it's not real effective, and one of the problems here in the state of Maine, you can't do it. You've you got you to jump through all kinds of special permits for uh, being able to use those. We have a grad student that's actually working right now with trapping uh, small mammals, collecting ticks off them, testing the ticks to see you know, how, what percentage of the ticks on the, on the rodents um, have Lyme disease, and they also do an ear snip, and they test the rodent to see if the rodent has the Lyme disease. And talking to him, you know, I, I said the same thing, because there's two ways of trying to do that. One way is just what you said with the deer. The other thing is they also throw out a whole bunch of cotton balls that's treated with a, a, a pesticide, and the idea is that the mice grab those, take them back to the, the and, you know, line their nest with these nice little fluffy cotton balls, and it works great. But the problem is, it's great on a small island where you can control the whole thing. But once you start throwing them around out here, you, you need so much of it. And you might get it, you know, right close by. But um, so from an angle of that angle, great idea, but doesn't work. The deer one, um, where they've done it, it doesn't seem to have made that big of an impact. As I say, you've got to go through a lot of hoops. So if you want to try it here in the state of Maine, there's a lot of hoops that jump through to be able to do it even experimentally. Um, and I haven't seen that it works that great. You think it should, just like, you know, the one spot on your cat or dog and, you know, the ticks, some of them die just crawling on them. So, but you've got to wonder about those too. If you, geez, I don't know if I want to pat my cat or dog if, you know, a tick cry <laughs> just dies from crawling on it. All right then. Since many deer and other game animals are infected with diseases, are there any health risks from eating them? And what they found too, that uh, uh, they do some serological surveys, the Maine Medical Center has been doing for years of deer um, during the hunting season. They come in and they just take a little bit of that blood that's left over in the cavity. And a huge population, or a percentage of the population of deer in the state of Maine have been um, infected at some point um, with Lyme disease, or at least they've been exposed to Lyme disease because there's enough titer in there to, to show that uh, uh, they've had ticks on them and been exposed to Lyme disease. Uh, the only thing is, you know, the question could become as to the actual hunter as they're, you know, eviscerating the animal, if they cut themselves and the blood got in, is there, you know, uh, some of the organism there that would get into you. But we, uh, everybody kind of suggests now to hunt is to carry you know, rubber gloves with you when you're doing that because there's lots of other things out there. Rabbit hunts, tularemia. Uh, they've been saying that for years. So, Next question, what about vaccines for people and pets? Yeah, um, there is a vaccine. I should say there was a vaccine for Lyme disease. Um, there's one now that they have for dogs, very effective on dogs. They don't have one for cats, and oddly enough, cats don't seem to be affected by Lyme disease, but dogs can be quite affected. Um... They had one for humans, and I'm going to say it was probably about 10 years ago when they took it off the market, there was problems with it. Some of the problems was um, some side effects of it, and it was only about 60, 70% effective. Um, so uh, even though you know, I, I think that would be good, uh, I think it wasn't good enough to you know, stay in the market. So they are doing a lot of research on that to try to come up with a new line. And now that there's getting to be more and more of it, the problem was for a lot of years, it was only kind of the northern tier of states that had Lyme disease. So it really wasn't on the radar enough to put 
millions, hundreds of millions probably, of dollars into creating a vaccine that's only good for a dozen states. But now it's spread so much, it's all the way out to the West Coast. They have black-legged tick out there, the Pacific black-legged tick, that looks just about like the deer tick. It's a little bit different, but it's a, it can uh, you know, transmit the, the Lyme disease organism too. Maine's a funny place. When we go into the woods, the danger isn't from bears, cougars, or alligators. It isn't from venomous snakes. In this state, it's the itty-bitty critters that'll get you. I grew up never knowing what a tick was. Now, I tuck my pant legs into my socks. I don't care if I look like a dork. Dr. Jim Dill gave today's Tick Talk at Fields Pond Audubon Center last month. It is brought to you today by Hammond Lumber, Napa Auto Parts, and EBS. Bob Duchesne's Wild Maine returns next Saturday morning at 9 and Sunday morning at 8. And remember, all shows are archived at 92.9theticket.com, so you can re-listen or share any show with anybody else. This is Sports Radio 92.9 The Ticket.